Palmer's picks. All right, man, I have my seat seat belt on. <laughs> um, so this this column of Palmer's picks focuses on contemporary hor- humor comics. They cite some some cool stuff, you know, Crazy Cat, probably the first mention of Crazy Cat in a Wizard magazine. Uh, and from there, move on to Matt and Harvey Kurtzman and, and give some overview of some of Kurtzman's works. You know, obviously the founder of Mad Magazine. The Mad Comic, that turns into the magazine. And then he did work uh, for Warren, a uh, magazine called Help. He self-published Humbug in the 50s, which was a humor mag. And then uh, it was Hugh Hefner who who uh, offered Kurtzman a chance at designing a more high-end humor magazine called Trump. Mm -hmm. That only lasted two issues, but is slick as hell. Uh, And the work that Kurtzman did, he is the father of the underground cartoonist in a a spiritual way. We're talking Robert Crumb, Gilbert Shelton. Yeah, exactly. Like, they're tracing this lineage of humor in comics, and exactly. They go from Kurtzman's publishing efforts and creative output into the guys he influenced. As you say, Robert Crumb and Art Spiegelman are two that are cited here who, you know, go on to be giants of underground self-publishing art comics. And the reason they're mentioned in, in this article is because they are the direct inspiration for the people who Palmer is, will be covering uh, in short. Yes. So, you know, after Robert Crumb and Zapp and Art Spiegelman and Raw in the 80s, the next, uh, the next generation of today's humor artists include Peter Bagg, Drew Friedman, Mark Martin, Doug Gray, Sam Hurt, and Doug Allen. And those are the artists that are covered in this column. Yeah, so I guess maybe we should start off with with Pete Bagg. And in the 80s, you could go through there, um, Robert Crumb was the spearhead of of an anthology magazine series called Weirdo. And uh, Crumb was the uh, initial editor. Uh, Hit or miss... A lot of, lot of spotty work, but also a lot of great work. And in fact, guys like Drew Friedman had strips in this in this comic. Amazing cover art. I always think of the weirdo cover art as like some yeah. of my favorite crumb. Really, really incredible. Now, these issues in particular are the ones that were edited by Peter Bagg. So it was initially edited by Crumb, handed it off to some young whippersnapper named Pete Bagg. And then Aileen Kaminsky Crumb would be the final editor of the series. Great Pete Bagg strips in there. And uh, Drew Friedman was well represented in that series. So from there, um, Pete Bag gained an audience, and with Fantagraphics, he started publishing his own magazine anthology series. That was that was all his own work, uh, maybe four or five stories per issue, called Neat Stuff. And I believe there are about 15, 16 issues. I, I have the run. Um, Beautiful work. I always enjoyed his cartooning. It's very singular. You know, I I look at his work and I can't tell you exactly where all the influences are coming from because it is very unique and and extremely cartoony, you know, bending feet, very wild expressions, rubbery. He's one of the few cartoonists who like legitimately can make me belly laugh while I read his stuff. He's probably one of the best writers uh, of comedy of, of those underground guys. And I didn't pull any of the the hate comics, but those would be the comics that would be out during the time this Wizard magazine was put together with uh, this character right here, Fuddy Duddy Buddy Bradley, uh, (laughs) is the uh, main protagonist of of the hate comics. Flannel shirt, trademark flannel shirt. Yeah, well before the the Seattle grunge movement. But Pete Bag had dark, heck of a humor. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, he Fanographics made a shirt uh, of. Of one splash page of of hate that said, uh, I scream, you scream, we all scream for heroin. <laughs> and, uh, you That's know. such a great cover. These are amazing, though. You know, very graphic. Not what you would think of as traditional comic book. Uh, Incredibly rigorous. And this is a piece of Drew Friedman work right here. He toured Johnson, famous, well, famous cult actor in the, uh, the 50s, appeared in a lot of Ed Wood movies. Inspiration for Big Lebowski this issue (laughs) yeah beautiful stuff i got into it uh in in an earlier episode i believe episode six um but personally pete bag was incredibly important for me in 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 my career and i get into it there so check that out um from pete bag we segue into drew friedman 
who was a school of visual arts student in New York under the tutelage of Harvey Kurtzman, Art Spiegelman, and Will Eisner were teachers at that time. And, and those guys would bring in people like Robert Crumb to talk to the kids. So we're talking like uh, the Mount Rushmore of comics, essentially teaching this, this, these, these young upstarts. And a lot of those students took the ball and ran with it. Uh, some of Friedman's classmates would be um, uh, Kaz. Kaz tells the great story in uh, an issue of Comic Art Magazine when Mark Beyer came in and was talking to the class and, you know, showing his art. And if you're not familiar with Mark Beyer, it has kind of a very shaky, I don't know if neurotic is the best word for it, but it's kind of the shaky style, very stylistic. It's very, and, it, and it's uh, it, it looks juvenile. Like, it looks like very rigorous kid drawing. <laughs> so Kaz asked him if he drew that way on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think Mark Beyer left. And Mark Beyer has not been seen since. <laughs> What a class, man. Wow. Heck of a class. And and Spiegelman poached his best students. And one of those students being Drew Friedman. Uh, his work at the time... Very celebrated beyond comics as well at this point. Huge illustration career. His, his dad was Bruce J. J. Friedman, who wrote many a, many a script, many a screenplay. Um, his brother, also a famous writer... Yeah, Josh Allen Friedman, fa famous uh, t t the Times Square book. Where if you like that show, The Deuce, you have to read Josh Allen Friedman's uh, Times Square book. Um, but many of the uh, early assignments that Friedman did for for School of Visual Arts showed up in Raw magazine. Mm -hmm. The most famous one being the Andy Griffith one, where it turns out that uh, Andy from Mayberry and Barney Fife or secretly members of the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> uh, Harvey Kurt Kurtzman intro letter, and he, and he talks about exactly what you're saying, Ed, you know, the, the School of Visual Arts uh, student there. So this is very old work, and this would be the work that showed up in, in Raw, but let's just go to the more mature style so that people could get a sense of, of his work. So what he would do is basically... Uh, he used a stipple technique. He used he used a, a tech pen, and just just dotted almost like a sewing machine to create these gray tones. And it was way more than a gimmick because his the subject matter of his comics um, were basically nothing but people who would show up on a grainy old black and white tube television. Uh, so the aesthetic is perfect for the subject matter that that he's that he's talking about. And he had two major early collections that, that covered his, his stipple period because you can't keep this up no. for a career. Your eyeballs will go away and, and you will get the next step beyond carpal tunnel. <laughs> yes. Like your, your wrist will become petrified. <laughs> uh, so he now does watercolor. So um, this, this first book is called Any Similarity uh, to Persons Living or Dead is Purely Coincidental. And this has been reprinted recently. So you could, you could find that and uh, his other popular collection with Penguin is called Warts and All. And there's a uh, nice uh, uh, embossed uh, cover where you could actually fill the pumps yeah, on these that's, guys. That's ugly amazing. <laughs> but Friedman was a super important cartoonist to me. I was, I was infatuated with the, the rigor of, of, of the work that he was, he was putting together, man. So I went, I went through my own um, Drew Friedman period and I, and I grabbed a couple pieces. Kurt Vonnegut introduction. Kurt Vonnegut introduction um Fr friedman amazing friedman is highly respected amongst i mean he's you know he's a member of the friars club he did the the comic book and illustration work in both of the howard stern uh books miss america and private parts so he's he's been all over the place you've seen his work he's, he's done work from everywhere from mad magazine to entertainment weekly and it's all funny it's all crazy um he, he fell victim to the thing that we, we all fear in that he got sued for libel by this one uh, uh, New York-centric host of like a public access show called, called Joe Franklin. And uh, because he would just he would just incessantly do these dro <laughs> these Joe Franklin uh, uh, comics where he's making fun of the guy's height and getting his ass beat and like all kinds of stuff. Talked with uh, Drew not too long ago. They made up. It's all good. Um, but I want to just show off a 
piece or two of Eddie P's uh, Wanna Be Drew Friedman period, man. Amazing. There's a uh, JFK with a hole in his head, and there was a, uh, back when Eddie P had, had hair, he looked like a, like a young, uh, nerdy Sid Vicious. And I remember just this eyeball. I did this caricature over the um, Christmas break while at the Kubert School, and just this eyeball took from the beginning of David Letterman to the end of Conan O'Brien. Wow. So it's like two hours for just that piece right there. This is beautiful. What's the response of your instructor at Kubert uh, School? Do you bring this, do, do you show this to them? What's the feedback? It, it was, it was an <laughs> assignment. break your arm, kid? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was an assignment, and the assignment was to do a self-caricature. And the lesson that I learned that was it was a profound lesson actually and I, I carry it with me to this very day because I didn't have to do this. I spent my entire Christmas break busting my ass on this piece here and I got the same A as a kid who dashed off a sketch. But yes. that motherfucker ain't doing anything cool in his life. Well that's the difference. You know, you say you don't have to do you wouldn't have to do this. Yeah. So what's the lesson? What's your takeaway? Bust your ass yeah. and, and and don't worry about <laughs> Don't worry about like uh, just getting by. That is always the answer. And, and, and this idea of like, I'm going to figure out a way to circumvent the rules, your expectations, whatever, like you don't even have to be there. So, you know, whatever shortcut you're desperately seeking, you can just walk out the door. I love it. Like, like because a lot of people have that mentality and I don't, and I get to step over them as I advance my career. Yeah, for sure. All right. Uh, Mark Martin. Anything on Mark Martin? I'm a, I'm a fan of Mark Martin's work. I have the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle comics that he did. Didn't pull them out. Um, yeah. But, you know, they're good. They're okay. Yeah, we've talked about him a little bit in the past. Nat Rat is a big uh, high profile for him. And yeah. lots of anthology, alternative comics anthology type work. Then there was a guy named Doug Gray and Sam Hurt. I don't know their work uh, yeah, very much. Yeah, I do not either. Um, I don't know either of them. I Beam... By Sam Hurt, that is this strip. And The Eye of Mongombo by Doug Gray, n neither, I haven't heard of either of those. The Doug Gray Mongombo thing supposedly was uh, published sporadically by Fantagraphics, but I've never come across an issue of it. And the uh, the, the Sam Hurt Eye Beam strip um, appeared uh, in, in the Daily Texan. So, so that was... Um, the early Chris Ware work would have mm -hmm. showed up there as well. He was a self-syndicator, Sam Hurt, same as Doug Allen. And this was the era where a viable career option as a cartoonist was the alternative weekly market, doing a weekly comic strip. That's sort of where Matt Groening got his start. You know, the the, the trinity of, of that crew, Groening, Linda Berry, and Charles Burns, right. uh, really spearheaded the movement of self-syndicating your... Uh, you know, six panel comic strip or whatever to the weekly papers in every town. You call them up and based on their circulation, you know, if, if we print 300,000 of these things, that means you get 20 bucks a week. Multiply that by 20 papers, you can make a pretty good living. Also a very wide readership. You know, several of those people have had crossover success outside of the direct market, outside of what we think of comics. And part of it has to be because they were working with that wide audience. You know, they were doing work that resonated with the readership much greater than what we would find in the direct market. You know, Kaz, we mentioned uh, 10 minutes ago, is one of the SVA students. He did Underworld for a long time in those alt weeklies. There was a great art show um, that started at the Society of Illustrators a couple of years ago about the alt weekly cartoonist. Um, I think that's traveled around. It may still be traveling around. But um, yeah, there's a, there's a legacy of that platform for uh, some very, very good comics. And Doug Allen comes from that tradition. He he was um, making the Steven strip from 1976 forward, you know, doing basically a page of this a week. And this is a collection of many of, of his strips. Um, I was always, like, highly disturbed by this work because there's something more going on to it. And, and you could hear, you could clearly see that this, this was one week's worth of strip. Mm -hmm. This was another week's worth of strip so on and so forth. But uh, I first discovered his work from, from the issues of Blab, and it was a pretty awesome anthology series. Like, d don't confuse the... Even though it's the same 
technically the same the same title. Don't confuse the kitchen sink blabs with the Fantagraphics blabs because Monty Bo Bocamp um, just turned the the bigger Fantagraphics blabs into kind of like uh, art director pornography or something. You know, there's just beautiful illustration stuff. But these early blabs would have amazing comics by the likes of like Richard Sala. Early Klaus would be in there. Lots of Friedman would show up. Joe Coleman, I, I saw some. Yeah, but you know, there's there's Doug Allen right here. Yes doing some multi-page work and and he would be represented in um, almost every every early issue um but richard sala cover charles burns covers yeah these are great fantastic i couldn't find my drew friedman cover one with that guy who has the zits in the in the little uh, uh spanky spanky mcfarlane um derby on or whatever pinwheel hat <laughs> This is a this is a great introduction column to a lot of cartoonists that you could find at the time, as you said in these anthologies, Fanographics, Kitchen Sink, uh, the more accessible kind of uh, upper echelon of these alternative cartoonists at the time. Pretty good survey. Pretty good representative of what Palmer's Picks is going to settle into when it when it reaches its final form. And then, you know, um, he would do further reading, or in this case, a brief sampling of the major works of the various artists mentioned i think we've gone over all of those but uh what a resource you know we, we're gonna sing his praises probably every issue for a while until we get to the hepcats issues <laughs> then we'll just cut slight promos because you know what <laughs> nobody's perfect there you go we love you tom great column